serious swing. Well, more Okay, will the meeting please come to order? First, um, let's have approval of the minutes. Any, any corrections, additions, or subtractions from the minutes? Anyone? I have a motion to accept then. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. Tonight we have the following correspondence. A memo from the code enforcement officer regarding the high school bleachers, a memo from the police chief regarding the high school bleachers, an email from Mr. Baldler regarding comfy daycare, uh, comfy cape daycare, an email from C. Miller regarding B and B amendments, a letter from N. Stillman regarding comfy cape daycare, a memo from the code enforcement officer regarding U27-4-22. An email from Mr. Bowdler regarding Comfy Cape Daycare. A memo from the Code Enforcement Officer regarding the Cox Farm Stand. A memo from the Code Enforcement Officer regarding Paputa Club. A memo from the Town Manager regarding the Pond Cove uh, School Shade Structure. And a memo from the Town Manager regarding the High School Bleachers Site Plan Amendment. Maureen, are you almost ready there? Well, I think the first item. The first uh, item is the Hannaford that. Field bleachers, so they need to come up. Thank you very much. Will you please introduce yourself and briefly outline the project? My name is Tom Greer from Pickham Greer. I'm the engineer for the project. Um, I'm going to ask you to speak up just a little bit, please. <coughs> sure. uh, there should be a microphone over there. No? Maureen, is there not a mic? Yeah, it's right there. Just, just speak. Okay. That one. Right? Oh, okay. All right. You have a soft voice, so please speak I'll, up. I'll Thank try you. to be a little more uh, boisterous. Thank you. Usually I'm too boisterous. So. Um, okay. My name is Tom Greer from Pickham and Greer. We're the civil engineer for the project, working with the town to put together the bleacher project. Um, this is an aerial photograph that shows where the bleachers are located. This is, uh, shows the whole school campus. Um, where the uh, main entrance to the school is located off Route 77 here. As you wind your way back through, this is the high school in this location, the tennis courts. And this is the new uh, turf field. The yellow strip in here is where the bleachers will be placed to give you an idea of where it is relative to the campus. Uh, the nearest homes are over here in the back. Uh, and there's a small buffer of trees in, in, in that place. And obviously, we're very next to the um, resource protection area that goes out the back of the campus. Uh, this area does drain down into that direction and is, is in a tidal area. Um, as part of our approval process, uh, not only are we in front of you, but we're also modifying our site location of development application with the main Department of Environmental Protection. That application has been filed, and they're in the process of going through it as well. Um, the project is fairly simple. What we're looking to do is to place the bleaches in this area, and as part of that, we'll be locating uh, some additional, replacing some of the additional parking here next to the high school. The next drawing I'm going to show you sort of covers the area where my hand is, just to give you an idea of where we're headed. This drawing is in your package. We've colored it up to, to emphasize what we're doing here. All of the white area in here is all of the existing paving. Uh, you can now come down the access road and there's a semicircular parking uh, next to the athletic field. This is the new turf field in this location. And again, the yellow strip is where uh, the bleaches will be placed. Uh, what they do is they come back, they're centered on the field, and so they come back a ways, and we lose about seven parking spaces in this location. And what we'll be doing is replacing those in this location here with, with some additional modifications to the drainage. Um, this 
project does come under site location of development with DEP and there's stormwater treatment involved with, with the runoff and what we look to do is treat the runoff from the paved area. So this parking lot, additional parking here, gets drained to a new catch basin that ties into the existing catch basin which drains to an oil grip separator that treats the water before it's discharged so that we're, we're complying with that, with that standard. As part of your package, we've, we've supplied a revised stormwater management package. Um, it's a fairly simple, straightforward uh, proposal. In your package, we've shown you some typical bleachers that, that they'll be of the style. They're aluminum. Uh, they're closed uh, box on their feet so that nothing can fall down through it. Um, there will be a press box at the top of the bleachers in this location here in the center so that they can, can have uh, uh, video access to the, to the field a little bit higher up. There are a few trees that we're relocating and new trees that we're putting in. These circles here give you the, the location of the trees to, to soften the overall appearance of it and uh, provide those. Um, again, the, uh, one of the questions raised by the town staff was ADA access. The way these bleaches work, the front of them are, are roughly four, four to four and a half feet above the existing grade, which if you work your way back is just about even with the parking lot. So the, that this little access ramp right here will really, that paving will match right in with the, the lowest level of the bleaches, so you can get ADA access in this location. And then the same thing on this side, that, that ramp will give you ADA access to, the, to the, both sides of the, of the bleaches. Uh, there are approximately 16 spaces that will be uh, wheelchair accessible for, for the bleaches across the front. Um, if you're familiar with the field, there is a fence that runs around the outside of the field. This bleaches will butt right up against it, so there, so there won't be an opportunity to walk sort of in front of the bleaches between the fence and the bleachers. Uh, we are redoing the fence on the outside, which will come across the back of the bleaches here, so that again, the entire field is enclosed and you can control uh, access for, for uh, admission into the fields and that, that type of uh, access. Uh, it's a fairly simple project, as I said. Um, we don't intend on um, doing much more than just install the bleaches and, and do the pay. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? I have a couple of quick questions. Um, are there new ADA, the ADA handicap spaces? Am I looking correct? They're just to the right of the new, new bleachers? Right, right in here. And, and there are two. That's correct. There, there are others scattered across the campus that near the exits of most of the buildings is where, where they generally live. Okay. And um, the trees you had said that you're relocating, I see one that's being relocated. And we'll have, uh, I believe, two new ones here. Okay. So there's, there's, there's one here. Yep. And then two here. Yep. Again, they're, they're generally trying to locate them near the parking. Okay. Other questions? Anybody? Okay, we um, need to make first a finding for completeness. Is there a motion? Based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for an amendment to the previously approved site plan for the school campus for a 1,400 seat bleachers and parking at Hannibal Field, located behind the high school, located at 345 Ocean House Road, be deemed complete. Second. <clears throat> All in favor? So it's passed. Um, now we need to decide whether we want a site walk and a public hearing um, to be scheduled. We have had one email. I don't know of any other ones, just the one um, from Mr. I've, Davis. I've been to the site several times. Hundred, several hundred <laughs> times. Yeah, I, um, I, have no, I feel no need for a site walk. But well, we've also heard some concerns with respect to noise <clears throat> and noise abatement from some of the abutters. 
From what? I, I, I don't think we need, I, you know, I too have been there numerous times. I don't think I need a sidewalk, but um, I'm, I'm just concerned, if you will, about noise. Well, we're, we're still scheduling the public hearing, right. so we'll have a chance to. So is there anybody here who feels that they need a sidewalk, or if anybody wants to, just go over on their own? I mean, it's there. <laughs> And we can go, okay, so no sidewalk. All right, now, go ahead. I'm ready for most of this. Well, does anybody, is there anybody who feels that we don't need a public hearing? We have had one email of concern about noise, so probably should have a public hearing next time. Given that we've had some responses. Yeah, I think it's appropriate. Okay, another, go ahead, Peter. Anybody have anything else they want to ask or say before? Okay, go ahead, Peter. I move that based on the above, that the above application be tabled to the regular August 19, 2008 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Second. Any discussion? Um, I remember they wanted to get these things on order, so they have to wait another month then, essentially, to do that, right? I think that, was that part of the plan? I believe the, or the order will be placed contingent upon Planning Board approval. So we are looking to get approvals quickly so that we keep the prices that we have. How, what the, well, how long is the quote you got good for? Two days? Uh, I'm being smart, I like that. I know steel's going up and up and up. July 25th is the, the date where they need to be ordered. I know we, we required to have a public here. I, I guess you have one. Well, let's ask Maureen a question. Maureen, have you had any other feedback other than the one email? No. That's the only one we've gotten then. Just the one person. And there was a response from the police chief about the noise and about the traffic. Um, and this person talked about plantings. I don't, I don't know where you put them, though. Because the, the houses are... I believe if it's the same person we have talked to before. It's Mr. Kevin Davis. I apologize. I'm not sure. But my guess is that uh, he lives in one of these homes right here. He lives... Um, we don't have an address here. I don't know where he lives. So, and yeah, go ahead, please. And there is, there is a, an existing buffer line across here. Um, the, the objection to the noise, um, additional plantings aren't going to reduce no. the amount of noise. They, if, if you can't see the noise, sometimes you can't hear it as a, as a philosophy. But if you actually measure the noise, uh, trees will provide very minimal uh, noise reduction. So um, I, I, I don't think that there's a whole lot we can do in terms of, of noise reduction in that direction. I mean, whether you get to stands or not, you're going to have people screaming and cheering at the games. That's right. And, and they're either going to be standing on this bank or right. they're going to be sitting in the bleachers. So. I'm sure you'll have a few stomping on the stands, but you know, it is what it is. And, uh, and the police uh, chief said that they do patrol and they're there right. the nights of the they game. They are. So, yeah. uh, Right? Does it, it well, can perhaps we, we had to relook at this. I mean, see. do we need, have, is it, are we required to have a public hearing? No, we've just had the one email, and that's all. We get some sort all. of feedback. We set one out of caution, but we don't like to hold up projects. <clears throat> we don't like to hold up projects yeah. um, where, where there really isn't going to be any meaningful input in the public hearing process. But I, I'm, I could go the way, I guess, on this one. But if, if we do defer, and have a public hearing. The order can be placed contingent on approval. Is that right? Or is that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no. It has to. No. It isn't up to us. It, it, ha <laughs> it has to do with with you know prices are going crazy right now, and nobody knows what's going to happen. So we want to know from you what's the situation with ordering. Mike, maybe you can speak to this. Yes, Michael McGovern, Cape Elizabeth Town Manager. Uh, if I don't hear any concerns this evening, one, one reason I came this evening on the basic outline of the bleachers, my intent would be to order them uh, with the assumption that it will be approved in substantially the same form next month. Meaning, if there are some issues to address, such as noise, the ordering of the steel and putting them That's up isn't going to be affected by it. We may just yeah. add some things to the plan. Is that That's correct. I'm just waiting to hear you know, major concerns or objections. My primary concern is, is that the, the budget for this project is very, very tight. Sure. The town council approved a bond for 150000 
the citizens very generously donated 175,000. There's 325 in the kitty. The uh, prices for steel are going up, uh, and they're going up all the time. And so it, it's 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 very important to get the order in as soon as possible to get it hopefully up this this construction season. Uh, you know, if you table this to a public hearing, you know, unless I heard objections to the general outline of what we're doing, I would order the bleachers, uh, you know, later this week. Uh, but, but I do have a concern, and I'll use the opportunity to express it, that, you know, sometimes, particularly on municipal property, there's a tendency, oh, we'd like to have this, we'd like to have that. And, you know, I'd be very, you know, plantings are fine, but we, we really need to watch the cost on this because there's just not another pool of funds right now to go to. The citizens have been extremely generous. Uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, challenges with paying for energy and some, some other issues. And it's, it's not something that's going to be easy to come up with more money than is already there. So thank you for allowing me to say that. You're welcome. <laughs> any reason we can't disapprove this? No, no. Is there anybody that has any, any problem with just going ahead and approving the project tonight, given that we've only had one email, that the project is located a reasonable? How far would you say it is from the homes? Uh, well, this is about 100 yards. Okay. So it's... And, and so you have... At least 100 yards. 300 maybe, feet. Yeah. Maybe, maybe more. 200. Not quite so 200. What street is that? I, I don't recall. You know the... Yeah. Is it Longfellow? It is Longfellow. Well, I defer to the rest of you. What do you well, think? Well, let me answer your question. I, I do not, have, on principle, have an objection um, to waiving the public hearing. Uh, uh, but for this particular project, I think it would be appropriate to schedule a public hearing, uh, given the magnitude, given the support in the community. I personally support it, but I think there should be a public hearing. Are there opinions? Well, I'm, I'm at the same place Peter was. I could go either way. I guess my thought is, with regard to the feedback that we got from the one citizen, it almost seems like a turf field issue rather than a bleachers issue. I mean, the turf field is what's bringing out the crowds, and that's already there. And I, I think I agree with Jim that bleachers or no bleachers, it's still drawing a huge crowd for the high school games. So. I, I guess what I'm hearing, though, is <clears throat> if we defer and have a public hearing, we may take some input on the noise issue, which is Tom's concern. And, but I'm hearing quite clearly from the town manager, they're not going to hold up moving this thing forward based on what we're hearing, because generally we're all in favor of the general concept and putting, putting the bleachers in. It doesn't seem very, very likely that we would stop the project based on a public hearing from what I'm hearing right now. So I, I, would, I guess I'd come down on the 51% of let's have the hearing. I'm hearing we're not going to hold up for COVID in terms of order and uh, we'll hear out the, uh, the noise concern and if we can't address it with something the town can afford we'll have to cross that bridge then. I just want to say if, if, if they don't have a budget and we want to do something they can't afford it then we're just going through the motion so what's the point um, of doing a public well, Some hearing. of it's precedent setting though I mean I, I would rather continue on the course that we have been in when we get any feedback we have a public hearing because there is an issue out there. Okay. Well it is a municipal property yeah. So it's it's not it's bigger than just somebody's home. Right. I, I mean, it's a place where everybody. Okay. Scott, how about you? You haven't spoken. <laughs> I'm curious. Does the does the school have to meet some noise ordinance? So when they're having an activity, do they have to meet an ordinance? And could this, could the public bring that up? Or? I'm I'm assuming that's directed to me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, the whole campus has an appending site plan review. It's already been granted site plan review, and what you would be doing is if you approve this, you would be amending the site plan, and site plan approval includes noise regulations already. So is there, do they get a waiver during a sporting event? No. Uh, if someone made a complaint, we'd have to get out there with a the noise meter and check it out. Right. And complain to the code enforcement or, right. I can see it now. Please quiet down, you 2,000 people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure that the bleachers are going to, I think, I concur, that are going to have any effect on the noise level. Although the stomping of feet on true. bleachers does, well, uh, I guess I think, that's true. raise the voice. I'm not a noise expert, but I imagine that carries, you know. It's pretty loud. But how much are you going to do about it? No. Yeah. Elaine, how about you? You haven't said anything. Um, if there is some sense that there's public concern about noise, I think it would be good for us to hear it. We could talk about 
possibly doing some proactive monitoring once the bleachers go up, and that could end up being some kind of a condition. My understanding is if we have a public hearing at the next meeting and we hear what we're anticipating hearing, we could talk about monitoring, but we could then at that meeting go forward with the final approval. Is that right? Yes. On that understanding, I don't, I don't see any um, real barrier in having the public hearing since the order can be placed, and I would err on the side of going ahead and, and giving that opportunity. Okay, everybody, are I can, we? I can live with that, as long as you can place the order and get it. As long up. as they're placing the order. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Michael, are you comfortable placing the order? Okay. Yeah. I, I have a motion that I, I move that the above application be tabled to the regular August 19, 2008 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Is that second? Okay, everybody in favor? Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Okay, the Pond Cove Shade Structure Site Plan Amendment. The person who is responsible for this want to come forward, please. Great, good. We have plans here. I'll do it. Having triple duty tonight, Mike. Chairman uh, Michael McGovern, Cape Elizabeth Town Manager. I wasn't really prepared to make this presentation, but uh, I am familiar with the project and will be happy to explain it to you. The, there was a desire among particularly parents of uh, Pond Cove Elementary parents to have a playground that was environmentally friendly and that could also serve as a, as a learning opportunity uh, for the students uh, at Pond Cove Elementary. And as part of that, on the section of the Pond Cove playground that is closest to the police station, uh, if, you, if you can visualize that, uh, there's been a lot of landscaping and, and other work done there that's much more natural. Natural boulders, natural flow of water. If any of you have seen it, it's extremely uh, more attractive than it once was. Uh, after the, the kindergarten wing, wing was built on the back of the high school, that was sort of a, a no person's land uh, back there. And the, the parents who have been working on this have been working very closely, particularly with the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. And they've actually uh, raised money from the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, from the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, and even from Portland Trails, which I think is interesting, funding a project in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, but part of it is, is building this, this learning gazebo, or gazebo that you see in your plans. And uh, Maureen's finding it for me. And since it, it's, it's really a fairly small structure, it's very open. Uh, do you have it in front of you? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a very open structure made, made of natural wood timbers. Uh, you can see intended to, to fit very much into the environment. Uh, the closest neighbors are the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department, uh, the Cape Elizabeth Police Department, neither of whom are, are very concerned about noise uh, or other activities. Uh, it, uh, you know, it, it just looks like a, a wonderful addition for outdoor learning uh, for the student opportunity. The plan is, is to use volunteers to help build it along with the, the funds that have been donated uh, by those different groups. 
I'd be happy to answer uh, any detailed, uh, uh, any questions you have that aren't very detailed. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes, if we, if, we, if we table this till the next meeting, we'll not hold up ordering anything. I, I, I'll take that as a rhetorical question. I hope that you would approve it tonight. It's, it's a fairly simple project, very small structure, but any new structure on school grounds uh, like this does require, or a new use does require uh, planning board site plan approval. And this would be an amendment to the previously approved site plan. New structure. Anybody have any other questions? Anybody? Well, how do we feel about this one? Just, um, I have a motion for the board to go right ahead. I move that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth to amend the previously approved school campus site plan to construct a shade structure in the southeast corner of the Pond Cole Elementary School playground located at 6 Scott Dyer Road be deemed complete and approved. Make this you want to make okay. Well, I'll make the first one, then I'll have the second one. Okay, so, so we have a so second. So it's deemed complete. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Any discuss? Oh, I forgot about any discussion. <laughs> it's all <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Since it passed. <laughs> it's, it's too late. Madam Chair, I have another uh, motion to, for the board to consider. Uh, I move that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth to amend the previously approved school campus site plan to construct a shade structure in the southeast corner of the Pond Cove Elementary School playground and playground located at 6 Scott Dyer Road be approved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like, like to thank the board and also particularly thank the parents and teachers, the land trust and the others involved. There are, there are no school dollars in this, no municipal tax dollars, and it's a great, it's, I think it's another great example of volunteerism in Cape Elizabeth. I'll be a thank terrific you. addition. Okay, beds and breakfasts. Are we ahead of schedule? <laughs> right. Um, would somebody else like to summarize the amendments so people don't always hear me? Who would like to summarize the amendments for beds and breakfasts? If you'd like, sure. Amendments that you have before you, which we're calling the bed and breakfast amendments, actually um, they were referred to the planning board by the council at the request of a resident who wanted to open a bed and breakfast. In a review of the ordinance, the board has done a couple of things. Uh, one is that under the current ordinance, the renting of one or two rooms is a permitted use. And what the board has done is they've actually given that function a name they've called it a homestay. So they've created a definition of homestay. They've listed it as a permitted use in the residential districts. In their definition, they have clarified that the renting of one or two rooms can be done on a daily basis or it can be done over a several month or several year basis. So for those people who want to basically operate a very tiny bed and breakfast out of their home, that would be something that they could do with these revisions. Uh, the other thing that the revisions do is they change the definition of bed and breakfast. Um, it does state that it has to be the primary residence of someone, and um, you have left the maximum number of rooms that a bed and breakfast can have at nine. Uh, right now, bed and breakfast is a permitted use in the town center district. You have proposed that it also be a permitted use in the business A district. Uh, but we're in kind of a... Uh, a flux transition point right now because the really big zoning package that the planning board is working on is um, is the business a overhaul district amendments and those amendments uh, cover the entire district in an effort to try to not send to the council different packages of amendments that both address the business a the draft in front of you does not list 
bed and breakfast as a permitted use in the business aid district. What I've done is I've added it to the draft business aid district that you've already been working on. So if you want, it can be put into this draft. Uh, I'm a little concerned that I think the council would like to have one comprehensive draft for the business A instead of having it broken up into pieces. But certainly the planning board can put that in tonight if they want to. And then the final change you made is you did create um, a specific parking requirement for a homestay and there was already a parking requirement for a bed and breakfast and you enhanced it by requiring parking for employees. Just to take a one second break. Um, oh, okay. Well, we can do it probably too. Okay. Um, all right. Do we have anything we want to discuss with these amendments before we start the public hearing? Or what, why don't we have the public hearing first and then we can discuss it? All right. Public hearing is now called to order. And if anybody would like to speak about bed and breakfast, but before you do, I just want to say that we have had, we've had a lot of response to this. We had a, sur uh, not a survey, but a, um, what do you call that? People sign a petition. petition that I think 179 people signed. I counted them, but I could have missed one or overcounted by one. 100, 179 people supporting beds and breakfasts, although it wasn't clear where they wanted them. And we had 19 individual emails in support of bed and breakfasts. And we had 14 individual emails, one of which was signed by two couples uh, that were against beds and breakfasts in especially residential areas, although we have altered the way it stands now so that beds and breakfasts are only a permitted use in two areas, the town center and the VA district. So anybody who would like to speak about beds and breakfasts, please come to the podium, state your name and address, and tell us whatever you'd like. But would you please, when you're talking, let us know how you feel about beds and breakfasts in a variety of areas of town, because we've now shrunk the definition of where it can be to a much more limited part of the town. So please let us know how you feel about that, too. Hi, good evening. My name is Katherine Miller. I am a resident of Crescent View Avenue. And I'm here to, to state my opposition to bed and breakfast in two conditions. One, in residential neighborhoods. I do not think a bed and breakfast as a business should be contained within a residential neighborhood. And as the ordinance amendments are drafted right now, it doesn't sound like that's a viable threat. Um, it sounds like you're considering it more to be in a business zone. Um, I just reassure you that's a good decision. We shouldn't allow businesses to creep into residential areas. I think as the amendments are drafted, it does allow somebody to rent a room under the homestay um, amendment. And I think that's appropriate. That's a balance, a small use of um, allowing you to use your home to rent out a room um, under the homestead, homestead. And that would be appropriate for a residential neighborhood. What wouldn't be appropriate is a bed and breakfast. And as it's drafted, that bed and breakfast could be as large as nine rooms. And I think that that's a number that we've gotten back up to. It sounded like the board con contemplated keeping it at a smaller number. And as a, as a eavesdropper, or as in the backdrops of hearing your workshops, it sounds like that's a number you guys have struggled with. Um, it sounds like you've been at smaller numbers. It sounds like you got back up to nine at the last workshop. Um, I'm not really sure why. It sounded like that might have been even an arbitrary decision. And I, I would submit, consider six. Bed and breakfasts, from the research I've done, are generally smaller. They're not as large as nine. That's creeping into the size of an inn. The other thing that I found was, um, as part of the workshops you were, um, you were brainstorming, um, it became clear, and we've heard over and over again, that we... Um, we compare ourselves to other similar communities when we're, we're planning um, and to use them as a sounding board. When you look at Falmouth, Cumberland, Scarborough, Yarmouth, um, and North Yarmouth, there are no bed and breakfast. They're not a permitted use. There are no bed and breakfast. So Scarborough, the only they have Pine Point, which is a little bit different, but they, it doesn't seem there's bed and breakfast there. Yarmouth doesn't have any bed and breakfast in um, Falmouth. 
and doesn't. Freeport does, but that's very defined, and it's in the zoning district, the business zone district, um, which brings me to my next point. Businesses, the business district right now, particularly I'm concerned with the BA district, is limited to Old Ocean or Ocean House Road. Allowing the, the zoning lines to be redefined to expand the existing business district to side streets is a dangerous precedent. By allowing the town to say that a business district can be redefined, re-outlined, expanded into residential areas is really a poor precedent for our town. It's the law of unintended consequences. You're allowing other houses to be picked out of the map and put into a business district simply because that business owner wants to have a business there. It's allowing more traffic in residential areas. It's allowing more people in residential areas. And it's defeating the purpose of a residential area. Uh, this farmhouse um, that you've heard a lot about in, on um, Crescent View has a historical value. It was the original farmhouse that was part of the subdivision of Crescent View Avenue. Allowing a farmhouse to be plucked out of the residential area that it was attached to from the beginning of the inception of the subdivision would, is, is kind of just going against everything that this was intended to be. This was the farmhouse that we were on the farmland. Crescent View is a small neighborhood and there is no ocean access through it. But you have to take off two streets to get from, old, from Ocean House onto Crescent View. If you were to allow a bed and breakfast to be on Crescent View Avenue, um, allowing either a business bed, uh, business, um, excuse me, bed and breakfast to be in a residential area, or B, it could happen by redefining and re-outlining the business zone to expand it to allow it to be in a residential area. Either way, allowing a bed and breakfast on Crescent View Avenue would require cars to drive off onto Kettle Cove Road and then turn onto Crescent View. That's two roads off Ocean House Avenue. No other businesses are two roads off the main road. Business zone should be a business zone. It's the arterial of our town. It's the state highway, 77, and it should be kept there. I think expanding it to allow it to be in neighborhoods is just a, a dangerous. It's where our kids play. It's where the school bus is. It's where we'd walk. It, having nine rooms as it is will mean 18 more people in that neighborhood a day. They're always looking for ocean access, and I'm sure that Anybody would, on that area, walking around the street, is looking for ocean access. And they tromp over neighbors' properties, and it's just a matter of time before they, they cross over somebody's land trying to find ocean access. The other thing that concerns me about the amendment as drafted is it doesn't require the owner of the real estate to live there. It requires a permanently residing person. And I think the amendment should be more defined to be the owner of the real estate. And then they have a vested interest in being there. It's not an innkeeper, it's not anybody other than the owner of the real estate. And as a town, even if we have bed and breakfast in um, the business zone, it's still their viable community, they're a citizen of our town, they have a vested stake at the town, and they should be the owner. I think that if you look at the petition you received, and a, a total of 179 signatures is clearly impressive. It's a message that there is, there is a desire to have bed and breakfast in Maine, here in Cape Elizabeth. But if you look closely at the petition, I don't think that it says that anything about expanding business districts into residential districts. I don't think that it really cl clearly defines whether the, the house that that petition is attached to should be supported, or whether the simple concept of bed and breakfast in Maine. I, I, I think the bed and breakfast is a good idea, but I think it has to be something that's very carefully thought about, which I think you guys have done. And I think it has to be very closely tied with the town center or Ocean, Ave, Ocean House Ave. Um, allowing it to be in smaller residential streets and allowing more traffic in our residential neighborhoods is just dangerous. And again, our, the towns that we compare ourselves to doesn't allow that. So um, I ask that you critically look at the petition, um, see what the signatures really mean, what are they supporting, and if they're really in favor of expanding the business districts into residential. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mark, um, Mark, did, you, did you open the public hearing? I, yes, I missed that. Okay. I did. I did. I, I That's fine. The gavel. 
Um, somebody else who would like to speak about beds and breakfasts? Good evening. My name is Mike Duddy. I, I live at 11 Crescent View Avenue. Um, and I want to make a few comments regarding the uh, amendments that are here before you, uh, but just also begin to help sensitize the planning board to some of the issues that I think will flow from these amendments down the road. Um, I also endorse the concept of having the owner of the property of the bed and breakfast be the required primary occupant of the property. And, uh, I think it does exactly what uh, uh, Mrs. Miller was saying earlier, which cre creates a vested interest in having the primary resident be sensitive to the needs of the town and the neighborhood. <clears throat> I think some thought might also be given within the current amendments to the number of rooms that a bed and breakfast is permitted to have in, in the business district, um, where it is clearly on the main artery, perhaps the nine rooms is appropriate, where it borders a residential neighborhood, you might have a second tier um, room maximum of six or four or less, so that you begin to create a sort of a buffer um, to the extent that you move off the main artery. But one of the um, issues that's going to flow from the amendments inevitably is that there's going to be a movement afoot to expand the business district to include the property across from the Kettle Cove ice cream stand down in the Kettle Cove area. Uh, move the business, the, the boundaries of the business zone into an existing residential neighborhood. On that point, what I really want to do is ask for the planning board to begin to take sort of a global look at how um, changes to ordinances and zones and so forth in the town um, are unifo uniformly applied across different town boards. Let me give you my specific example. Five years ago, I applied for a building permit to do an addition on my home, which was to essentially cut the roof off and go up, create a new second story at 11 Crescent View Avenue. As part of that construction project, I applied as well um, for a permit to build a porch on the front of my house, a six-foot porch. The permit for the porch was denied because my front setback would only allow me to have a five-foot porch on my house. So I um, appealed the decision to the Zoning Board of Appeals, which heard me out and ultimately denied my request for an appeal to permit an additional 12 inches of porch on the front of my house to make it a neighborly house, a, a spacious porch where I could sit and, in fact, increase the community aspect of the neighborhood the Zoning Board of Appeals denied the, the request for an additional 12 inches on the grounds that, that since there weren't enough other houses that had in, um, infringed the front setback by 12 inches, if they granted me a variance to extend my port from 5 feet to 6 feet, it would change the character of the neighborhood. So a town board said, no, Mr. Duddy, you can't build a six-foot porch, only a five-foot porch, because a six-foot porch would change the nature of the neighborhood. What's going to come in front of this board ultimately is a request to expand the boundaries of that business zone to include the major property in my neighborhood. And if this board says, gee whiz, sounds like a good idea, it's a unique property, it's an interesting location, it's not on the main artery, but it's near an ice cream stand in Kettle Cove and so forth, go ahead and do it, it creates this lack of uniformity in how you treat town residents with regard to what they can do in their neighborhood. On the one hand, an individual homeowner like myself is denied a, uh, an appeal to increase the width of a porch 12 inches, where on the other hand, you might um, um, give approval to change the major structure in the neighborhood to accommodate a use that doesn't exist at all. So I just, I, I mean, I want to tee that issue up as you move forward in this process, I'm sure I'll be back in front of you again to make a plea for uniformity. If you're going to move in the direction of expanding the business zone into a residential area, uh, then the question is, I'd like to have a second bay on my garage. Why can't I do that? I'd like to, in fact, have an eight-foot porch on my house. Why can't I do that if somebody can plop down a nine-room uh, bed and breakfast uh, at the main entrance to the neighborhood? 
Thank you. Thank you. Let me say clearly that right now all we're considering are the bed and breakfast amendments. This has nothing to do with any specific property. Um, we're not talking about the business A district, but we have, we've made a, con we made a decision just to allow beds and breakfasts in business A and the town center. This has nothing to do with changing any of the lines. That's a whole different discussion that we'll be having over the next probably couple of months. I mean, we have been talking about the business aid district. We've just received the wetlands report. We have to take that into consideration um, to make sure where all those lines are and what's possible and what's not. And this has nothing to do with taking in a property on Crescent View. It does have to do with the number, which we did we did go from six to nine in the proposed. Are we going to go through the whole public hearing? Before yeah. Start up okay. I, I just I, wanted to explain I that. And I understand about no, the you're right. Issue. Okay. Who else would like to speak? <clears throat> My name is Tom Tinsman. I live at uh, Two Emerald Way here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I've lived here since 1957, so I'm a long-time resident of Cape Elizabeth. Um, as I travel more in my later years, I, uh, I use bed and breakfasts when I go away and travel and find them to be a, a great alternative to small hotels and motels. And what I find as I travel around to bed and breakfasts is that most of them are located in residential zones, very few of them are actually in a commercial zone unless it's a very large commercial zone and it happens to appeal to that kind of use. But most bed and breakfasts are in residential zones. It's my hope that the town updates our ordinance to include bed and breakfasts in the ordinance, but I would like to see them not change any zone lines to do it. Um, I think there are many appropriate properties in Cape Elizabeth that would be very good for bed and breakfasts that are currently not in commercial zones. Um, and I would like to remind everybody that every business zone that we have abuts the residential zone. And, um, but I don't think it's appropriate to expand our commercial zones at this point because if we're talking about bed and breakfasts, it would be very easy to address the issue of bed and breakfasts by coming up with a list of criteria that makes sense to the town of Cape Elizabeth and fit it to properties that you feel would be legitimate candidates for bed and breakfasts. And I've heard some mentioned before, and, um, and I know you're not talking about specific properties tonight, but I, I would like to see the ordinance updated. I would like also to see the town not consider changing commercial zone lines to infringe upon the residential areas of our town, because I don't think you really need to do that. I think what you need to do is come up with a list of criteria that makes sense for a bed and breakfast and stick to that criteria. Um, and I'll give you one other perfect example. I know we're not talking about uh, individual properties, but there is a large property right across from Fort Williams, uh, the Levada property. And uh, um, that property at one time was a bed and breakfast or an inn and it, it does abut a residential area, but if that were allowed to be a bed and breakfast, I don't think it would be appropriate to make that a commercial zone to do it. It would be the only property commercially zoned in the area, but it would be an ideal property for that. And, um, and, and I know it's a, a consideration for the future. Um, so I'm, I'll be watching this with interest, and uh, you know, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to make some comments from time to time. But, my biggest uh, comment, I guess, is that I'd prefer to see the town not change our commercial zone lines because I think that gets into a whole can of worms that we don't really need to address. Thank you. I have a quick question for you. In the inns that you stay in, what tends to be the size, the amount of rooms that are in the inn? Typically under 10. I mean, um, you know, I think 10 is a big bed and breakfast, but mostly 5 to 10. Um, and there are smaller ones, sure. um, uh, but usually the, the smaller ones are hobbies, more right. or less. They, they could be the homestay type of property that the, the town is allowing for two rooms. Um, but uh, bed and breakfast is typically five to ten, I think. Thank you. 
Board may just be interested to know that Mr. Tinsman was on the original Town Center Planning Committee who created the Town Center Zoning that you're now using as a model for the Business Aid District. Thank you. Which was a very interesting process and you know, worked with Maureen. I, I learned a lot about that process. But, um, you know, one of the things I've learned from Maureen, uh, we had a, one issue about historic properties at one time and that didn't pass, but it was very easy well, I don't want to say it very easy, but it wasn't a hard process to come up with a list of properties that would make historical uh, significant properties in Cape. Making that same list of properties that would be appropriate for a bed and breakfast, say of a certain size, certain size lot, certain access to the major arteries, um, those types of things, there'd be a, a lot fewer properties in town that would be appropriate for bed and breakfasts than the historic uh, list that we had come up with a long time ago. So I, th I think it's a, a very doable process of, of identifying properties that would be appropriate for bed and breakfasts and then coming up with a list of criteria that matches those types of properties. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Hello, my name is Tara Bucci from 4 Kettle Cove Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, I have two issues that I'd like to just present to you that you've heard from other peers from our um, neighborhood as well, other friends. I'm very opposed to um, having bed and breakfasts in a residential area for two reasons. I moved here from D.C. to get away from the city. Lived in a very diverse area with lots of residential um, and businesses combined. And it wasn't a very nice area to live in. That's why I chose to leave D.C. to come back to Maine and to live here and to teach here. I'm concerned about the safety for people in the area. Um, as you know, it's a very busy area already in Cape Elizabeth in the summer with tourists and people coming to visit. It's a very difficult place to be as a citizen and to see what happens in the summer with people visiting and speed and noise and um, a lot of dangerous things happening in our community during the summer and we're sort of aware and we're cautious but when the fall comes we sort of take a sigh of relief as well. I'm concerned about the um, change in the residential area if we allow bed and breakfast is in the zone there. I'm also concerned about the size. I believe that six is a great number to stick with and not to go over. That's 12 people plus the staff of that house and the residential people in a bed and breakfast if you choose to allow them in the business areas. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy Irving and I live at 27 Crescent. A little louder, please. Sorry, that's Thank my you. demeanor. Um, I live at 27 Crescent View Ave, and I'm not going to talk about Crescent View Ave, but I'm going to talk about travel, because I do a lot of it. And I do stay in bed and breakfast as well. And I had an uncle who owned a bed and breakfast. Um, the bed and breakfast that I have stayed in I go from Ireland to Hawaii, um, so, and I stay in them quite frequently. And normally, my uncle's was a four-bed bed and breakfast. But I have not stayed in a bed and breakfast that has been over six rooms. And I would petition that you think, rethink about nine rooms. That's a lot of people um, that are coming into any home and they're transient. And um, it's just not the feeling that a bed and breakfast gives you. It's for an intimate relationship with the owners and it's to meet new people and to talk with them. So I would have you consider a number less than nine, um, six would probably be okay, but even even smaller um, might be preferential, especially in a community like Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Karen Dunphy. I'm a resident of Cape Elizabeth and have been so for 25 years. And I want to ask you to think for a minute how the evolution of bed and breakfasts came about. They weren't, in, you know, they didn't start in a commercial building or in a commercial area. They started in someone's home. And they may have started as a homestay. And, and when there was room to get larger, they got larger because there was demand for it. 
So I absolutely agree that we have wonderful properties here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and many of those properties were uh, the original farm family home for what are now neighborhoods. And those wonderful properties, I mean, I can, there are lots of them throughout Cape Elizabeth. I don't believe they need to be in a business zone. It's an it's a offshoot of a home business. Um, it's, it's, I think it's the kind of business that we would want to encourage because there's very little impact in the town from people who are coming through for two or three nights. Um, we get, you know, a lot of them, I would imagine, would be relatives and friends of people who live here and simply can't afford to stay in some place like the Inn by the Sea. I know my parents can't, um, but I'd love to have them come and stay close, but there's no option. Um, in some of the towns around us, there are, there are far more rental properties, maybe not bed and breakfast, but more options for short-term rentals. Scarborough has tons and tons of weekly rentals. Um, you know, Pine Point Beach, Higgins Beach, there's lots of opportunities to come for a short stay and not be in a big motel or, or in the city. And I think that opportunity is something that you should really consider. And the fact that a bed and breakfast, I mean, if you go any travel anywhere, I've been to Ireland, all over this country, and they're usually grand old residences. They're not a warehouse business or in an office building or even a condominium building. It's a residence. That's, why, that's what you go to a bed and breakfast for is that home, wonderful atmosphere. So I would urge you not to isolate them and limit the opportunities by requiring that they be in a business zone because I think you're going to miss the whole point of a bed and breakfast, which is to use the big, wonderful old residences that people have had. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we need your address, please. 23 Columbus Road, and I mean, we have a house on the end of our street on Mitchell Road that would make a fabulous bed and breakfast, and I, for one, would be thrilled to have it in the neighborhood because I don't think we would notice it at all. I mean, I really don't. And the Kettle Cove area, there are lots of areas that get a lot of traffic in the summer. Maxwell's Farm, you've got other things that draw people out to that area, and other areas of the town as well. So I really don't think that bed and breakfast will bring tra enough traffic to worry about. Thank you. Somebody else who would like to speak, who hasn't spoken? No, I think we're just going to let everybody speak once, unless anybody disagrees with me. Okay. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Go right ahead. We're not talking about a specific project, just about the concept. We're not dealing with a specific property, though. We're just dealing with the idea of beds and breakfasts and... And, and the proposed amendments. And the proposed the amendments. Zoning. But we, we don't have a proposal or anything we're sending to the town council concerning changing the zoning lines. No. no. That has to do with the business aid district, right. not with this. Just speaking about beds and breakfasts in general related to this particular amendment, that's all we're talking about. We're not presenting projects tonight. Sorry. Could you it, the, the yes. And do we have anywhere a, a, a map that shows us what areas we've been talking about? Can I that? Yes. There's no proposed change in the current zoning districts. So the only changes there are there's a change that would redefine renting of one or two rooms to a homestay. And that would uh, be a change that would take effect in all of the residential districts and all the business districts that currently allow the renting of one to two rooms. And then there's a proposal to change the definition of bed and breakfast, and there's a proposal to add bed and breakfast as a permitted use in the business A district. There's no proposal to rezone any properties from residential to commercial tonight. Let me just read. This is proposed. Remember that. We're still discussing this, so it's only proposed. Let me read the two definitions to you. I'm sorry we don't have a, a graphic for it. A homestay, a use that is accessory and incidental to the primary use of a dwelling as a residence and that, one, provides 
one or two furnished bedrooms for rent to guests for one or more nights. Two, is operated by the family or person residing permanently in the home. Three, may serve one or more meals to guests only. And four, provides all parking on site. A maximum of one homestay is allowed per multifamily building. That's homestay. Again, proposed. Bed and breakfast, a use that must be operated in conjunction with the use of a dwelling as a primary residence. And that one provides up to nine, and again, just proposed, furnished bedrooms for rent to guests having a length of stay not to exceed 14 consecutive days. Two is operated by the family or person residing permanently in the home, and three, may serve one or more meals to guests only. That's all we're talking about tonight. I, one other thing I wanted to bring up, because it was brought up earlier, was the, uh, the concept of the owner. And as I understand it now, Maureen, the definition of bed and breakfast is an owner no, occupied. occupied. The well, current definition. So we, don't, we didn't need to change that. No, no that's, 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 that's no, but that's, well, but that's not what it to, says in this to, definition. The current definition, which is proposed to be struck, says an owner-occupied building in which up to nine guest rooms are used to provide overnight accommodations for guests having a length of stay, not having yeah, right, right. for guests, period. And what you are doing is adding, you, what you did is you wrote the homestay definition and then the home state definition actually deals with various concepts. And what you did is you reoriented the bed and breakfast definition so it deals with the same concepts in the same order. So there's some parallel matching. So the bed and breakfast, it says a use that must be operated in conjunction with the use of the dwelling as a primary residence. It does not say that the person who owns the bed and breakfast has to be the one that is living there as a primary residence. So in theory, under this definition, and I'm just trying to understand it, you could own it, lease it to somebody who's going to run it as a bed and breakfast. They'd have to live, the person who runs it for you would right, have, have to, to live, live there. there. And in fact, I actually got a call from a town resident who was inquiring about the opportunity to do that in what would be considered a locally historic building. Meaning buy it. Buy it, renovate it, and, and have, and, tenant and have it. someone else run it as a bed and breakfast. But that person, run, quote, running it would have to live there. That per the person running it would have to live there, but the person who owned the building would not have to be the person who runs it. That's well, not the way I understand well, let's, let's wait to hold this discussion until the public hearing is finished. Because we can change anything we want to here. We don't like it, we'll have another proposal. So I just want to be clear, this is about this proposal and nothing else. It has nothing to do with any project. So would you like to speak in general about the proposal? Yes, ma'am, sure we would. Okay. I'll try. Um, I'm Chair uh, Rick Light with Stantec and representing uh, Sean Tamir. And we may both be speaking tonight uh, on behalf of the BA District Zoning. Um, B and B District. B and B and, and the BA District. We're not talking about the BA District tonight. We're only talking about B and B. The B and B language, as it's currently proposed, uh, we would propose one change. I, I guess I'm going to pose a question just to follow up on the previous discussion. It's just to be clear. Under the new language, uh, the uh, paraphrasing down to section two, is operated by the family or person residing permanently in the home. Uh, when you say person residing, if, if a B&B &B had a stated uh, manager, that manager could live in the home, could live there permanently, that would be, except I'm just trying to clarify what Well, that that's is. the way it's written right now. Right. That may not be the way it ends up, but okay. that's just the way it's okay. written right now. Very good. The, the other item on, under the, the definition that we would like to change is the number of rooms from nine rooms to 14 rooms. And let me explain why without getting into a particular project. That we've done research on B&Bs uh, throughout the main coast and other towns. I'll give you a good example. Uh, the breakwater in Scarborough, 
by comparison. It's an historical structure. It's very similar, in fact, in both in time period to this structure. It's on Higgins Beach. You've probably all seen it on the corner there on, by the beach. That is a B&B, &B, which has 15 rooms. That thing has operated successfully without issue with neighbors that we know of. Uh, it's, it's been there for eons, and, and, op and, it, it, it's, not, and it's compatible with the neighborhood. A B&B, &B, we feel, can be up to 14 rooms or thereabouts because the way the ordinance is written, I hope to be written, would invoke the performance standards and the design, the performance standards and design guidelines in the ordinance, as well as site plan review. And those standards would dictate the compatibility of a building with the surrounding neighborhood. Let me give you an example. If a building is six rooms, or a B and B, would it be six rooms, or seven rooms, or eight rooms? The issues that a neighbor to be compatible, to meet the criteria of being compatible, that would be important are those design guidelines. What is the buffering relative to that building? The, the ordinance, the way it's written now, the, uh, is the draft that we have, talks about the design standards for the building, building massing and building style. The planning board would have right of review through site plan approval and site plan review to look at the building for what it is in the terms of its compatibility issues which would be written into, as I understand, the proposed ordinance changes. If a, if a unit were to be 14 units, or uh, a building were to be 14 rooms, it doesn't mean that all B&Bs could be 14 rooms. If the lot size, given the setbacks, given the abutting, the, uh, maybe if there's the inability to, to landscape or buffer to meet lighting standards and parking standards, you can't put 14 uh, rooms on a B&B. So it's not the number of rooms that to us is the most important. It's, it's the size, it's the nature of the project, it's the standards that, are going to, that, that Maureen has drafted that would invoke both design standards, compatibility standards, and all the other design guidelines of articles, I think it's seven and nine, if I'm speaking correctly about the design standards. So it's not specifically a numbers issue, a number of rooms, if I'm making any sense. I'm going to add to that, Sean? Yeah, and, uh, and also within an existing structure without expanding uh, over and above what the existing structure allows and is already in, in use. So I think that the language says here, over a certain uh, square feet of, of an existing property, which we're not proposing to increase. We're not talking about a project. I know, but even though, all due respect, even though we're not talking about a specific project, I mean, there is a specific project at stake here, and we have to put things in perspective. So when you say well, we're, not, we're, not advocating, we're not advocating today on a specific project, but that is a relevant uh, point in the sense that we're not proposing anything over and above what already exists in this particular project. So if this could be, if this could be a, um, I guess, a standard build-up, that's what we would like the, the board, the planning board, to look at. Does that make sense? Can I ask you a question? Are we discussing as well the 1965 BA district proposed? Not at this point. No. Just the definitional, just the definitional yes. inclusions. Okay. Then we won't speak to that. So I guess in our comments, just to be clear, that the two items that we would suggest the board or ask the board to consider would be the, the size of the, uh, under B&B &B definition, that use that would allow up to 14 rooms um, under that, under that uh, definition. I think we have no problem with the rest of the definition. No, we don't. No. I think the only thing is what we brought up in the, in the first meeting. Which which what we are what we are proposing is is to create a, a bed and breakfast or to see a bed and breakfast in town that fits um, uh, within the comprehensive plan of of the town. Uh, not anything extravagant, not anything that, that hasn't been done before in residential areas uh, in in other towns and cities around the United States. Um, if you have anything to add to that. So we want to make it short. Thank you very much. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken who wants to speak? I think almost everybody's spoken. Right? Close the public hearing. Open it to the board. I'd like to modify the language um, of the proposed draft to insert the words owner occupied in subparagraph two where the it will then read, number two, 
is operated by the owner-occupied family or person residing permanently in the home. And I'd like to make the similar change in the bed and breakfast paragraph below the homestay. Any discussion on that point? I agree. I was going to make the same change. Yeah. Okay. And so can I, can I just clarify? So what, you're, what we're saying is unless the owner of the property lives there, you can't do a homestay and you can't do a bed and breakfast, right? That's correct. Which is what I thought we were saying in the first place. But. Well, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> well, but let's just think about that, though. I mean, we are limiting a person's use of their property so significantly by saying you can buy it, you can renovate it, but you can't go out and lease it to somebody. To run. To run. You have to, if you want to do it, you have to do it yourself. Which is where we started this discussion in the first yes. place. Yes. Yeah. I have never stayed in a bed and breakfast, and we've stayed in lots of them. That the owner wasn't. That the owner wasn't part of the property. I think you have a very different situation Absolutely. when you buy a house, you renovate it, and you turn it over to a manager. And conversely, Entirely I've stated different. numerous places that were not owner-occupied, <laughs> and it was very clear. Yes, I agree. They're more like inns. Or hotels. Or hotels. I think the owner, I was under the, uh, I have been operating under the assumption that it was owner-occupied. And, and then you have that commitment from the owners in terms of, is there anybody other than Beth who feels differently about it? Well, I've stated a lot of bed and breakfast, both that have been owner-occupied and the people who are living there who are managing it, and they've been great. I've also stated some owner-occupied that have been horrible. Wow. You know, so I think we're making some huge assumptions here that anybody who leases the property isn't going to do a good job, and anybody who owns the property and lives there is going to do a good job. I would caution no, I, I agree very that careful it's a, about that. It's a huge that. assumption. I, I bet more on the latter. But... Well, Scott, how do you feel about that? I don't stay at bed and breakfasts. So. Oh, well, <laughs> I like big fancy hotels. Okay, we'll let you. <laughs> I guess I, I share Beth's concern. Um, I think this is it, it's an issue that I hadn't really thought through before, and I'd want to think it through. But it it troubles me to tell a property owner that they can't lease their property to someone um, to run a bed and breakfast. Why? If, if, if the property was owned by parents and children were occupying it and wanted to operate a bread and breakfast, it seems so to be there are many s scenarios. It well, it, it, it all depends on how we would. So the owner family. or the family of the owner, is that? I don't think that was what was proposed. Well, homestay but, says family. Well, bread and breakfast you, doesn't say family. Well, yes, it, it, yeah, it does. Uh, second down here. Yeah. I think it, it, depends, it depends how we how we word it, but... Oh, operated by the family, okay, down there, got but it. But what Tom's changed is the family could do that. And that's a different story to me. And I just want to say, I mean, I am very cognizant of you get different standards at different times, but, mm. but my experience has been that when there is an owner-occupant present, that the level of service is at a higher level. And, you know, you try to do as much diligence as you can about a place before you stay there, but um, my experience, limited as it may be, has been that when, when you have somebody who has a vested stake in the premises, that the level of care, the and, level and it's of service location. is going to be higher. And it's location. So, I, mean, uh, I it just seems, think... It seems to me if, if, the, if the owner who's there would be way more responsive to neighbors' concerns on every level, aside from the size issue and everything else, if they're sort of dealing with the same issues, cars coming in, cars coming out, people speeding, you know, crowds, whatever, it's a completely different response from an owner. So are we now talking about putting these bed and breakfasts back in residential neighborhoods? No, we're not Except talking about that yet. Well, to me, that, that well, I think they're big, hand in hand. I think, I think that makes a big difference. If we're, if we're talking about the proposal here where we're not having bed and breakfasts in residential neighborhoods anyway, it seems to me to require that they be owner-occupied in a BA district or in the town center is, is a little bit inconsistent. We don't uh, require any other business in those districts to be owned or operated, but to be operated by their owners. 
if we're switching back and we're talking about bed and breakfast in residential districts, then it's a whole different set of criteria. And that, that's in great part what troubles me. We're talking about a town center district and potentially a business, a VA district, mm, where we're talking about businesses, a bed and breakfast as a business. And quite honestly, I have some difficulty with the rationale that the owner's going to give better service, that the owner's going to pay more attention. If you have got a person who's leasing the property, who's dependent on the income coming in, and the level of service and the recommendations, it seems to me that there would be equal, if not more, attention paid to running a good property than an owner. I, I, I don't buy that, particularly if it's in a business district or in town center where it's an up and running business. Those just don't work for me. They do for the homestay because of where those properties are. I have no problem with that. But bed and breakfast, I don't think we have. I do not agree with putting an owner restriction on that. No. Would that would your opinion change if we were to go back and talk about putting opening up uh, when I say the arterial and the collector I don't know if the collector roads to open up more Arterials. properties which would then border on residential areas would your opinion would your thoughts change on the owner occupied Not necessarily park? no because I think a person who is there to run a good bed and breakfast, be it owner or not, is still going to work hard to do it. They're still employees. I, they're I, employees of owners. I don't too, agree right? if, it, if we just, if I agree with, I see what you're saying about a business district, and I think you're right, that if, if we restrict it to the business district or the town center, then we need to be a little more flexible about who runs them. I think if you're talking about a residential area, we need to be careful of how many properties we may have to if we decide to put it back, we may really have to beef up the design standards a lot. Um, talk about the size issue, too. Yes, and the size. I mean, that if, if we're going to talk about putting them back into residential areas or recommending that we put them back you know, on major arterials or something, then I definitely think they need to be owner-occupied because I do think you have a very different level of responsibility from an owner. But we're not there, though. No, we're not I mean, there. We're not there. We're not so there. let's not jump to that, because we, we already went through that and eliminated that as a possibility, you know, given we could go back and change our minds. But right now, we're talking about a definition for a homestay and a definition for bed and breakfast. The homestay attaches to the residential districts and the bed and breakfast right now, just town center. Yeah, and, and be, we're recommending that it be in the BA if we change the But not the in BA, this so. amendment. Pardon? Not in this amendment, though. Well, right. not in the cement. Right. That's right. We're just talking about the uh, yep. definition. Right. Uh, Tom, can you, you uh, stated at several bed and breakfasts. What percent, can you tell when you, uh, what percent have been owner run, where the owner's actually been there? And can you give some examples of how the service is better? I mean, again, mine is purely anecdotal evidence, all right? And, and, and I agree with Beth that oftentimes you can go in and you just simply can't tell. But I have experienced occasions where, where we've had the luxury of going to a, a, a nice B&B and you have a complaint about something. And whoever's running it says, well, I can't deal with that. That's the owner's responsibility. I'll have to talk to the owner. And generally that's, you know, after you've left. Um, where there's a one-stop shop where it's somebody who, you know, you go and you say, there's something wrong, whatever it is. And I, I mean, I'll give you a good example. At Hilo in Hawaii, we stayed at a and b where there was a, a common room, and the common room, the air conditioning was just too high. Crazy here in Hawaii, right? So <laughs> where, where the owner said, and, and they were an operator, and they said, I, I can't do anything about it. It's the owners, and the owners want to keep it at that level. And so, you know, that, mm. if that's one anecdotal evidence of it, if you will. I can come up with a number of others, but it's generally that kind of one step away from being able to be where the buck stops. Barbara, do you have any? Well, I've stayed in them all over. We've stayed in the United States, in Europe, um, in, in Canada. I've, we've stayed in a lot of bed and breakfasts, and almost invariably they are owner-occupied. And when we stayed in places that are not owner-occupied, they are essentially inns that are 10, 12, 14, 15 rooms. We stayed in one in Edinburgh, and it was very, very different. The managers are there, and they're managers. They are not 
owners of the property. They don't have the same investment in the property. They don't have the same feeling about the property. An owner ha has a different level of commitment. It's also a very different feeling when you have an owner who's in the property and you have five or six rooms. I think somebody brought up the point um, this evening that it's a very, you, you get to know the people who are in the bed and breakfast. You interact with them. You interact with the owners, and it's really very different. We've probably stayed in 30 or 40 beds and breakfasts, which is quite a number. Hmm. Hmm. I think we're kind of mixing up concepts, though. I mean, I granted there's a big difference between going to stay someplace where there are four rooms and you have a very personal relationship. But, and the difference has a lot to do with the experience of the guest as opposed to staying someplace where there are 12 rooms. But I'm not sure that as a planning board, we need to be focusing or should be focusing on the experience of the guest. That's not really our issue. Our issue is the maintenance of the building, the experience of the neighborhood surrounding the building. We don't really care if your eggs are cold or if your air conditioning is too hot or not hot enough. Our issue is what the prop, how the property is maintained as it relates to people outside of the property. So is someone who is an owner occupying the property going to do a better job of, of maintaining the facility in a way that complies with our ordinances and our requirements than someone who is not? And, and, and to me, that's, that's not so much a foregone conclusion. I also think we're mixing up differences that have to do with owner, non-owner, and differences between 14 or 15 rooms or five or six rooms. And, and there, are, there are definitely differences there, but um, maybe we need to go back and reconsider whether nine rooms is too many or 14 rooms is too many. But I don't, I don't think that relates to who the operator is so much as the, the size of the, of the facility. I think we also have an, an ordinance that says 10 rooms is a hotel right. in that's place. Right. So yeah. that's why we that's stopped right. at 9. Right. And I, I think, though, I don't completely agree with you because how the property looks and how it affects the neighbors. The neighbor calls up and says, you're making too much noise. We've had 50 right. cars in and out of here. And the manager says, well, I can't make that decision. I have to call the owner. And he's in New York. And he's in New York. And the owner says, oh, my goodness, I live here. I need to do something about this right now. And I think we need to look at that and how it affects the neighborhood. And um, sure. But I also think that Bath has a very good point, in, and we need to think about if we're going to stick with the VA district and the town center, maybe we really do need to look at it differently. And we need to say, well, it's okay. I mean, it's a business. The pizza place is run by a manager, and the bank is run by a manager. Why shouldn't the bed and breakfast in the business district or the town center? And I think you have a really valid point. Well, I don't agree with it in a neighborhood. And I think for homestay, that we've got a pretty good definition written. I, and, I agree with that. And that needs to be owner-occupied. We need to strengthen it, I think, the way Tom suggested strengthening it. But I really want to caution us not to make these assumptions, because we don't know if we call a manager that they're going to say the owner has to do it. I lived across from the Irving Station for 12 years. On Saturday and Sunday, when Joe wasn't there, the help would crank up the acid metal rock so loud, particularly when I was trying to sell my house, which is really interesting. And I would call over, and it would go down. Nobody said, now, of course, the owner of that property is Irving. Nobody said we have to call Irving. Joe would come over on Monday and say, the assistant manager told me, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again. He wasn't the owner of that property. Responsible, we can't dictate that responsible people run these places, whether we want to or not. So I really caution us to be clear on what we're here to do and what we're here not to do. We can't make assumptions that everybody who leases a bed and breakfast to run it is going to be irresponsible. I think that's irresponsible of us. So where do we go from here, everybody? I think we're clearly not ready to recommend this to go to the town council. It's just listening to the tenor of the discussion. I'm not sure what everybody else thinks. I agree. With you. I agree. I hate to send it back to the workshop. Is that what you're saying? That's, that's what I think. Could you say that, Jim? I don't want to say that. <laughs>
Okay. I have a motion for the board to consider. May I, may I ask a question first? Do you think we're ready on homestay? I mean, maybe we need to separate these. One really has nothing I'll, to do I'll, with the I'll other. I'll defer to Maureen's comments on that. I, I guess the answer is I, not. I can't imagine the council being happy to receive this in dribs and drabs. Okay, that's fine. Never mind. But I don't think we're going to, when we send it back, I have no intention of revisiting the homestay, other than I think we're all pretty clear we want the owners to be in yeah, the homestay. No, I'm yeah. absolutely fine I'm with that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, Tom gave the language I think we yeah. all agree with. Is that correct for the homestay? For the homestay. Okay. So should we just send it back to make a motion? All right. I guess um, motion for the board to consider be order that based on the materials and the facts presented, the planning board does not recommend the bed and breakfast amendments to the zoning ordinance, zoning ordinance to the town council for consideration. Is that what you want to do? No, we want to send it back to the workshop. Well, I guess that's implicit. I guess I'm, no, and send it, no. no? Let me be clear. The, it was the just only, a drill. The only motion I drafted for you was a motion where you would discharge this to another body. Oh, gotcha. So if send you want to send it back to um, a workshop, you should say that planning board tables okay. this to the August 5th workshop. Okay. I'll try that um, Please. <laughs> Based on the materials and the facts presented, the planning board, uh, we uh, recommend that we send it back to the August 5th workshop for further consideration. Second. All in favor? Brilliant, Jim. Okay. That's why they pay me the big bucks. Yes. I can tell I know. <laughs> Past 8.30. <laughs> okay, anybody have anything else? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Hey, okay. Everyone. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the public hearing. Yeah. It's the most excited I've been in days. We're going to do this. <laughs>